Daniel Arap Moi, former Kenyan president who ruled with iron fist, dies at 95. Former Kenyan president Daniel Arap Moi, who rose to power promising to end tribalism and corruption and to make his country a Cold War bulwark against communism, but who brutally crushed political opposition, deepened ethnic tensions and enriched himself at the public's expense, died February 4 at a hospital in Nairobi. He was 95. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta announced the death but did not provide a specific cause. Mr. Mwa was one of the last of Africa's so-called big men who presided over their countries in increasingly despotic ways. During 24 ruinous years in power, he curtailed political freedom, presided over the stagnation of Kenya's economy, and encouraged patronage politics. He enshrined his name on currency, schools, an international airport and other prominent sites throughout the East African country. Despite condemnation by human rights groups and allegations that he had stolen millions of dollars in aid money, Mr. Mwa's ties to the United States remained strong because of Kenya's staunch anti-communism and relative stability in a region ravaged by war and by leaders who were even more erratic. We've been having peace for 39 years, Mr. Mwa told a crowd before he stepped down in 2002. Sometimes when I hear all the criticism, I ask myself, are you tired of peace? I wish people would go to the neighboring countries and then speak. That year, Transparency International, an anti-corruption group, called Kenya one of the most corrupt countries in the world, assailing the nation's police and judges as among the worst offenders. Kenya remained a mostly poor nation. While its economy grew marginally, corruption and crime became entrenched under Mwa. In the years before Mr. Mwa became president, most Kenyans regarded him as unthreatening. A tall, immaculately dressed former schoolteacher who belonged to neither of Kenya's two largest tribes. He seemed, by all appearances, the opposite of his predecessor, Jomo Kenyatta, the war-scarred hero who led Kenya after it gained independence from the disappearing British Empire in 1963. Mr. Mwa had been vice president to Kenyatta, and he took over after Kenyatta's death in 1978, having gained broad support by promising to maintain a balance of power among Kenya's tribes. He was a member of the Kalenjin tribe, and the two largest tribes, the Kikuyu and Luo, had ruled the country since the pre-independence period. Early in his presidency, Mr. Mwa's administration claimed to be primarily concerned with such objectives as good governance, economic development and tribal harmony. Mr. Mwa established a free milk program for schoolchildren and released political detainees. Then, in 1982, Kenya's constitution was amended to make the country, which had been a one-party state in fact, a one-party state by law. This helped spur a coup attempt by Kenyan Air Force officers who were Luos. With the support of the army and a paramilitary police force called the General Service Unit, Mr. Mwa crushed the uprising and arrested and replaced almost the entire air force. He paid bonuses to loyal military officers and gave farmland to others, further cementing ethnic divisions in the country. At one point, he ruthlessly engineered the fall of a key supporter, former Attorney General Charles Njanjo, a Kikuyu. He explained, You know, a balloon is a very small thing. But I can pump it up to such an extent that it will be big and look very important. All you need to make it small again is to prick it with a needle. Taratacharap, which means son of, Mwa was born September 2, 1924, north of Nairobi in the remote hills of the Rift Valley. His father was a cattle herder. He was baptized by missionaries and given the name Daniel as a child. After his father's death, his paternal uncle arranged for his education at mission schools. Mr. Mwa eventually received a certificate in public accounting from London through a correspondence course, and in 1945, he began a career in government schools as a teacher and administrator. Mr. Mwa did not participate in the Mau Mau insurgency against British rule in the early 1950s, but he supported the movement and took in several fighters during that time. In 1960, he was elected assistant treasurer of the newly formed Kenya African National Union, KANU, a political group that would become the heart of the independence movement. A year later, Mr. Mwa, fearing that KANU would not serve minority interests, formed the short-lived Kenya African Democratic Union, made up of smaller tribes. The new party was absorbed into Kanu at Kenyatta's urging to form a united front at the time of independence. As president, Kenyatta appointed Mr. Mwa to several positions. One of the most important was Minister for Home Affairs, which made him head of Kenya's national police, prisons and immigration departments. There he made connections that would prove helpful to him as president. He was appointed vice president in 1967. After Kenyatta's death, Mr. Mwa automatically became interim president. He preached national unity at first, and he promised to put an end to government corruption and to form a multi-ethnic coalition 
On October 6, 1978, thousands of Kanu delegates, wearing shirts that read, Mwa, the son of Mzi, loved, unanimously elected Mr. Mwa to lead the party and become president. His grip on Kenya, then seen as loving and patriotic, quickly turned into a fiercely clenched authoritarian fist. Bill Berkeley, a journalist and author who has written extensively about Africa, observed in The Atlantic that Mr. Mwa was widely loathed and presided for years over a predatory single-party regime that was made possible by the patronage of the West. Dot, 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 during the Cold War, the United States poured billions of dollars into Kenya, helping to sustain Mwa's patronage-based government and enrich his clique. The early 1990s brought an end to the Cold War, the beginning of international scrutiny of violations of democracy in Kenya, and a push to hold multi-party elections. Until then, Kenya had one state-sanctioned party and no limit on the number of terms a president could serve. The U.S. ambassador at the time, Smith Hempstone, was widely credited with making clear the lack of tolerance for Mr. Mwa's crackdowns on political dissent and other abuses of power. The leader initially fought hard to resist such pressure to democratize. As demands for freer elections intensified, Mr. Mwa's government tortured and killed political opponents, burned homes and destroyed media organizations that criticized the government, according to historians and human rights organizations. In the face of criticism from the West, Mr. Mwa received support from surprising quarters. During an international tour, South African anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela paid a visit to Nairobi in 1990 and said, what right have the whites anywhere to teach us about democracy when they executed those who asked for democracy during the time of colonial rule? In late 1991, international donors suspended payment of $350 million in aid to Mr. Mwa's government, a devastating blow given the country's crumbling economy and declining tourism. The president reversed himself and directed parliament to change the constitution to allow multi-party elections. They were held in December 1992, and Mr. Mwa won with just over 34 percent of the popular vote. He won again in 1997, even though he again received less than half the vote. The opposition failed to join forces against him. Historians also say that massive fraud and voter intimidation tactics that left hundreds dead and thousands homeless contributed to Mr. Mwa's victories. As economic despair continued in Kenya, Mr. Mwa appointed Richard Leakey, a fossil hunting paleoanthropologist and politician, to lead the civil service in 1999. Leakey was a longtime Mwa opponent with a reputation for honesty, and he proposed measures to eliminate waste and corruption, which included cutting 25,000 civil servants from the public payroll. Mr. Mwa sacked Leakey in 2001, just as the country had begun to win back the trust of international aid groups. Leakey had earlier told an interviewer, when you sit down and talk to him, he doesn't come across as venal, scheming or dangerous. He comes across as congenial, compassionate a benevolent leader. You can tell him your frustrations and you leave feeling, boy, that man is really concerned. Kenya's constitution required that Mr. Mwa step down by 2003. Rather than attempting to remain as president, he gave up his hold on Kenya. He engaged in modest redemption by leaving power said Scott Taylor, a Georgetown University scholar on African politics. The ethnic tensions that were part of Mr. Mwa's legacy have continued to spark violence in Kenya, most disturbingly in 2007, after elections that some complained were rigged to keep the Kikius in power. Hundreds of people were killed, and many more were displaced. In his private life, Mr. Mwa kept his ex-wife, Lena Bommet, and their eight children out of public view. He liked to present himself as a devout Christian who read his Bible every day. He denounced hippies and miniskirts, and he didn't smoke or drink alcohol. One of his favorite accoutrements was a silver-topped ivory stick, a symbol of a prosperity that was rare in Kenya outside his inner circle. He told an audience in 1997 that he was misunderstood as a leader and that many of his critics were duplicitous. I am not a dictator, he said. Although people blame Mwa now, one day they will understand what Mwa was. Al Cinder is a former Washington Post reporter. Adam Bernstein contributed to this report. National security during this time he took part in the series of conferences preparing Kenya for independence and ensured that the new government would be a federal system providing regional autonomy to protect the minorities. When Kenya finally gained independence in December 1963 and Kenyatta became prime minister, Mwa was designated shadow minister of agriculture. Kadu's fortunes declined and it was dissolved with most of its leaders, including Mwa, joining the ruling Kanu. At the end of the following year, when Kenyatta became president, Mwa was sworn in as Minister for Home Affairs. This was an important post as it made him head of Kenya's national police and charged him with the responsibility for maintaining national security.
while retaining this post, in January 1967, he was appointed Kenya's vice president and vice chairman of the Kanu Parliamentary Group. During his period of office as Home Affairs Minister, most foreign observers agreed that Kenya had far fewer political prisoners and less internal repression than almost any other African country in the post-colonial period. Air Force disbanded when Kenyatta died in August 1978, Moi immediately became interim president, and from the outset, he made it clear that he would keep the country on the same pro-Western course. In October that year he was elected unanimously head of Kenya's only political party and became the country's second president. After the elections the following November, he carried out a restructuring of the government. The reshuffle was the biggest since 1963 and an attempt to strengthen a position hampered by the system he had inherited. New ministries, such as natural resources and the environment, were brought in, and other ministries, such as agriculture, were split up. In August 1982 there was an attempted coup to oust him, but it was crushed by loyal sections of the armed forces. Later that month the president disbanded the Air Force, members of which had led the coup. More political prisoners the incident gave Moi the opportunity to consolidate his power by expelling those behind the plot from government and by ushering in a one-party state by way of changing the constitution. Those groups that opposed this move were repressed. With the ending of the Cold War, Kenya's strategic position as a counter to communist influences in Ethiopia and Tanzania grew less important. The feelings of certainty that the stability of his regime once engendered gave way to increasing unease at the repression his government was showing towards his political opponents. The number of political prisoners grew, and Moi's government took measures to limit press freedom. In the 1990s, hundreds of thousands of people especially from the Rift Valley province were displaced, and hundreds were reported to have been killed in ethnic clashes, most of them belonging to opposition groups. Aid, so readily given in the past, was withheld to encourage economic, social and political reforms. Corruption scandal of these, the restoration of multi-party democracy was a priority. Moi succeeded in bringing this about and, by skillfully exploiting Kenya's tribal divisions, won elections in 1992 and 1997. But Moi's rule was typified by economic stagnation, and his government was so corrupt that the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank stopped lending to Kenya. The biggest single scandal was first made public in 1992. Known as the Goldenberg Affair, it centered on the theft of £400 million of public money that was paid as state subsidies to a company called Goldenberg International to promote fictitious exports of Kenyan gold and diamonds. It took 14 years for fraud charges to be brought against, among others, the company's director, the former Treasury Permanent Secretary, and the former Deputy Director of the Central Bank. An official inquiry suggested that President Moi must have known about what was going on, but he always denied involvement and was never charged. At the 2002 elections, from which Moi was constitutionally barred, he was a target of derision, and his car pelted with mud. His Kanu party was routed. At the ceremony in which he handed over power to Moi Kabaki, the crowd was openly hostile to Moi. In 2007 then-President Kabaki appointed him as the Kenyan envoy to Sudan because of his vast experience and knowledge of African affairs and his stature as an elder statesman. Moi spent his final years in retirement, isolated from the political establishment.